Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Ryan with Propelio, and today is Grant Teach Me Something. With Daniel over here, too. And Daniel, uh -oh. obviously, well, I was going to get there. <laughs> no, well, I got there first. He got there first. Anyway, today we're going to do a little things differently just because, you know, it seems like everybody's like, what's better? Rentals, cash flow, wholesaling, owner finance, blah, blah, blah. And the answer is, the right answer is whatever you're comfortable with. But so, disclaimer. Grant wants everybody to know that he is not an idiot. He realizes that you can make money doing rentals. And Daniel is also not an idiot, and he realizes you can make money doing owner finance. No, you can't. <laughs> but for the purposes of this video, Grant is going to be taking the, the flag, the banner of owner finance. The correct way of doing investing. There we go. And Daniel's going to be doing the, the rental side and, and the landlord side. The smart way of doing investing. Right, 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 right. <laughs> So that's kind of where we're going with. As always, please join in on the comments. Uh, throw the love, throw the likes, throw the fire emojis, the pregnant woman emoji, all those things. Um, ask questions, throw in your comments. That we, Even though it's going to be against these two guys, because they're going to be fighting it out, literally and figuratively and metaphorically. I came prepared for a gunfight just in case it got nasty. Is that why here. you brought a knife? I, I've always <laughs> got to have some form of protection. So, so anyway, but that's where we're going. We're going to be talking about rentals, rentals versus the owner finance world, pros, cons of both. Um, again, if you have comments, if you have questions, if you have points, counterpoints that you want to throw in, obviously this is Facebook Live, so I'll join in. Yeah. Um, can, can I simplify the debate for just a second, though? Grant's an idiot. Grant, you're wrong. <laughs> Done. <laughs> and that's our show. Please we'll like and comment week. every week, every Tuesday, every Wednesday. All oh, right. Man. So, so that's the that's the oh, obviously. And then um, let's do a book at the end of it. We'll figure out what book that'll be. Ooh. But what we'll do is we'll do those random Facebook comment picker thing like we've been doing the past couple times. So ask questions. The more comments you make, obviously, the more chances you'll have in the automated Facebook counter Connor picker thingy yeah so rentals versus owner finance what is is it owner rentals versus is it landlord versus bank, bank? bank. Yeah. landlords versus bank and go landlord versus banks and go landlords win <laughs> so here's the thing okay i think that there has been a false equation that happens in most new investors most people that are on the outside looking in a lot of people who have been in it for a little while where they see that rich people have rentals and they think that rich people got rich with rentals and I can pretty much 100% guarantee you that that didn't happen. You get rich and then you get rentals. I hear an erp, erp. So I've known Daniel, way too many people get filthy rich off of rentals. Starting not, from rentals? Starting from rentals. Did they have money at all before they started that? Mm -mm. No, I mean, I say no money at all before. I'm talking like $30,000 they had okay. before. That's like, that's, that's not like money. That's, no, that's not money. That's you've, you've put five years into your 401k. Yeah. But I mean, what, what what happened with a lot of those people, they just bought at the right time in the cycle. They were mm -hmm. getting rentals in 08, 09, 010. And if you've seen the appreciation cycle we've gone through in the past yeah. six years, like here they are sitting on a half a million dollars worth of equity that they cash out and reinvest into bigger investments. Mm -hmm. and, so, and I'll throw in also, as a moderating factor, I'm just throwing this, I'm hearing thirty thousand dollars buy a rental everybody i know that does owner finance they have a little bit more uh knowledge in the game of mm -hmm. real estate investing mm -hmm. they have a little bit more mentorship coaching hopefully. well they just oh, yeah, you hopefully, hopefully you see some bad people hopefully at least in my experience yeah, the they one. know <laughs> oh yeah yeah they, uh, anyway <laughs> they know more about real estate at that point in time to be able to do the owner finance deal mm -hmm. whereas anybody could be a landlord you just need to have a property I'm not saying they're all good. So I, you know, just from a moderating in between factor, it just seems like the knowledge. Basically, you could be stupid and be a landlord. <laughs> well, you got to be stupid to be a landlord. <laughs> hey! oh, oh, anyway, no. but I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt your point. Well, but here's so here's the thing with that though. I mean, if you've got thirty grand and uh, uh, you're trying to get a rental with it, you've got to be bankable. You got to be. You do have to have W two income. You do have to be able to get some type of loan, and or you need to be able to partner with somebody. Right. You don't always have to depend upon your own assets to do something. Right. But some of the benefits to the rental side of it, and I think the biggest issue I have with owner financing 
is whenever it is used as like a sole model for the business mm -hmm. because you're leaving so much money on the table. Absolutely so much money on the table when every deal you do is owner finance. Like if you're acquiring subject two, that's great. But turning around and selling every single one of them on a wrap just doesn't make sense to me because you leave a massive amount of potential profit on the table. I know when you owner finance and you go amortize a note out over the course of time, you're going to get the interest payments. You're going to get the benefits of that over time. But you're losing inflation. You're losing. You're losing. You're, you're losing against inflation. Mm -hmm. You're you're losing out on the amortization of somebody else paying down the note for you, and then still retaining the asset. I can, mean, can, can we go into that for? Because this is still a grant. Teach me stuff. Or it doesn't have to be grant. But it's something <laughs> about teaching. Can you go a little bit? Just a, a quick thirty second detour and really explain out what you mean by capturing inflation, capturing appreciation. Now, I realize that okay. we could do a three week series on it, but what's the 30 second elevator? If I borrow $100,000 from the bank today, everybody knows in 30 years from now, it's not gonna be worth the same 100,000. The difference is, is whenever I borrow the 100,000 from the bank today and I'm paying back that loan 30 years from now, I'm paying back that loan with crappy dollars when I borrowed good dollars to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I can hedge against inflation by leveraging the bank because every dollar I pay back to them that's worth less than the dollar I borrowed from them is a win for me. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. Thank you. So the challenge there though, and, and kind of the counterpoint to that is that, you know, if you don't plan on making any money from the rental until you have that rental paid off, I agree, right? But I think too many people get into rentals thinking, well, I'm gonna make all this money from rentals and and I just don't see, and I mean, you've seen people that have done it, right? With 30 grand, I well, just don't see people getting that without being bankable, without already having capital, without already having the ability to get that money. And then on top of that, if you're gonna make money, if you wanna actually make money with that rental on a monthly, let's get some cash flow in basis, you basically have to be having a rent that's twice your, your debt payment and the, the com or the uh, the likelihood of that happening is just very slim. Most of the time, I would say, at least ninety percent of the time, when I talk to a landlord who tells me how much cash flow they're getting, they tell me, "Oh, well, I'm getting four hundred dollars of cash flow," and I say, "Cool. So what does that mean?" And that means to them, they're charging nine hundred dollars of rent and paying five hundred dollars to the bank, and that is not four hundred dollars of cash flow. That is a gross income level, right? So. What I'm saying is, is until, and that's a, that's a lower end rent, obviously, right? Until you get to that point where you've doubled your debt payment for the rental income, you're not gonna be making any money on that rental. You're going to get appreciation for it. You're gonna have a piggy bank that you might be able to sell the property and get a large lump sum of money in, but it's not gonna be that thing that pays for groceries. Because you know, one air conditioning unit goes out, you pay five grand, you're not making profits on that unit for a year plus. Um. I'm right there with you on that. I mean, a lot of people buy rentals for cash flow. It is not my opinion that rentals are good for cash flow. Most of the time, yeah, you might make three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred bucks a month, but by the time you add back in your repairs, expenses, and stuff like that, you're in kind of in a situation where you're not really cash flowing. Most of the landlords I talk to, but there are right ways to landlord or wrong ways to landlord, and like we've already talked about. You can be an idiot and be a landlord. But if you come and approach the landlording as a business though, and you're buying at the right price at the right time with the right business model, the business model being go in there, completely rehab that thing day one. It's not like go in there and do a lipstick type of rehab. Mm -hmm. Go in there, put the new hot water heater in, put the new air conditioning system in, get the roof taken care of, make the inside of the property look really good so you can attract the right tenants price it right so that way those tenants want to stay and then your deferred maintenance should be minimal to none so i'm not doing air conditioning work i'm not doing plumbing work all that's already been taken care of and accounted for in my acquisition and if i buy it right i should be able to do that acquisition with limited to no money ultimately out of pocket so then i end up with the free house with the tenant that's paying it for me and then i'm not really having to deal with the tenants tool it and trash and if i time it right and i buy these at a low point in the market cycle i acquire 10 to 15 of them ride through an appreciation wave 
And then I can turn around and sell them all off. While I technically probably did cash flow through them because I didn't have the deferred maintenance, sell them off at the prime. Like I've got a seven year on my on my hot water heater. I've got you know probably five years of good service on my air conditioning system before I need to start maintaining it. My roof's got 30 years, but we're in Texas, it's more like 12. So once I'm five to seven years into this rental, sell it off before all that maintenance has to come back up again, keep my cash flow, roll those equity and the appreciation that I get from it into more and bigger investments. Boom! <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Can, can but, you drop a lapel, Mike? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's hard for us to banter back and forth on this because... Real quick, I did hear something, and I don't think you pointed it out, and I, I, you haven't pointed it out yet, and I know we're still very early in this topic, but I do want to point out that in both strategies, if you do it right, you can get essentially a free house. Mm -hmm. The only difference is in 20 years of cash flow, you still, a house, you still have a free house, per se, paid off that's still income generating, but... In this model, you have 20 to 30 years of a little bit better cash flow, zero headaches, but no house. Yeah, and you get five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars up front from the sale, right? That's so that's a, that's another thing about owner financing that I love that you don't get with the rental world because so I mean those are valid points, right? Everything that that you're you're laying out there. Are you sure? Because I, I made most of that shit up. <laughs> I, yeah, you you were like you were on the fly with it. No, I mean it's a it's a it's a valid way to look at it. Now the the problems that I have with the people for for looking at it from the terms of what most people who are watching this video are is the part where you said, well, just buy fifteen of them and the lower part of the cycle, right? Right. Well, yeah, okay. You know, if you can buy a bunch of rentals in the lower part of the cycle, that's that is great. You do get those benefits. But when are we? Uh, you know, right now, a we're not in that lower part of the cycle. So how do you make money right now? Uh, and and B. When you do those rentals, yes, you're, you do get the appreciation, that kind of stuff, but the people that most of the time that I'm interacting with, uh, both getting into this business and fairly seasoned into this, need that today money and the tomorrow money. Real quick, just because I think it's, 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 it's poignant forward. Mm, pertinent. It's P-O-I-G-N-A. Pertinent, 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 pertinent to this conversation is uh, uh, there was an article, uh, I didn't read it, but uh, somebody I trust in the economics world. Right? <laughs> so it's third party of a third party. Anyway, but he was just pointing out that the DFW market right now, it's not in a boom. It's actually a correction mm -hmm. uh, because the DFW market has always been more similar to a market like San Francisco, and we have just never gotten to those prices. So it's, it's, we're actually in a correction. We're not in a boom. Hmm. Um, real quick, just because we do have some comments coming in, and uh, there's a lot of questions ahead. coming in. Um, one thing Marcus Riz was saying is, is owner finance better than private money? Um, at a whole, that question, there's so many different levels because you can use private money for everything. Well, and it all at its on core, terms. owner financing is private money. It's, <laughs> it's private money from your seller. Right, uh, private money is something that you should be employing everywhere. Both, you know, if you can get long-term private money and you want to employ that into a rental, cool. If you want, can get long-term uh, private capital, you want to employ that into a or deploy that into a uh, owner finance, cool. <laughs> Subtle plug. Or if you have thirty grand, just give me twenty grand to mentor you, and we can use the ten to do some else. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, I do do more mentorship. <laughs> today is national. Did you know that today is National Creative Day? You do, because Trey told us all at the beginning. CreativeCashflow.com. Hashtag National Creative something day. Anyway, so, um, so private money is something that you've got to have, right? And right now is the time when we are in a, a market like this uh, where we don't have a national crisis going on. You know, People have capital they want to deploy. So you should be, if you're the person watching this video and you're the one person willing to go out there and be doing the work, you should be getting private capital with no issue. Now, here's the thing. That owner financing in and of itself is private capital. You are purchasing a property from somebody and they are funding it to you for you, mm -hmm. right? That's one of the things that I really like about owner financing here. You talked about, well, go out and buy 15, you know, rentals. Well, Fannie Mae caps you at 10, right? So but that's not that big of an issue. So many people make an issue out of that. That's not really that big of a problem. There's so much money out there. Right. And, and I mean, as you have your portfolio growing, you do have other funding things available to you. But you, you get I'm to saying, 10 of them and just re refine into a portfolio loan. Yeah, and that's then what I'm you saying. Like once again. you get 8 to 10, you do have some other uh, uh, possibilities Options. that let that open you up. You start early from a local bank, make friends with them. But at the end of the day, it's still your name on that loan, yeah. right? You are responsible, you are liable, you have that debt to you. With owner financing, you know, I have months where I buy 10 or 15 properties and none of that debt is in my name. It is all completely 
non-recourse in the LLC, and that's an asset that I'm gonna turn around on and make five, 10, $15,000 on the sale, and then start three, four, five, six, seven hundred. I mean, I've got a couple of properties that are cash flowing eight to $900 net with owner financing that I made seven to $10,000 on up front, and I never have to deal with it again. I mean, my joke always is like, when was if you've got a if you've got a, a mortgage with the bank, when was the last time you called Bank of America and told them that your toilet was leaking? Like they don't care. They're not going to do anything about that. We are becoming the bank. So for those of you out there that are looking at, well, what is my best strategy, right? Like that's what this whole conversation is about. What is the best strategy for me? Whether I'm getting into this business or I've only done 50 or 60 properties, whatever that might be, as you're building that out. Well, you can't buy, we talked about this like stealing Corey Thompson's, you know, what do you get with a million dollar net worth and a dollar in your pocket? You get a, a bottle of Coke, right? Diet Coke. Is Diet wrong Coke. Diet. <laughs> <laughs> so you need today money. You gotta be able to buy groceries. And so a lot of people turn to wholesaling or flipping for that today money. And then what they're losing out on is all the wonderful benefits on the long-term tomorrow money that you get out of a rental that you get out of an owner finance deal. But if you just turn to a rental and make it all tomorrow money, well, you don't have the money to go buy your groceries. If you're trying to make this a full-time gig for you, you got 30 grand to live on for the next eight months and you blow it all on buying a rental, well, congratulations, you've just made $300 a month out of that 30, 30, you know, 30 well, I, grand. Well, I can completely and totally agree with everything you just said. You're kind of misappropriating data because you're saying, I blow $30,000 on a rental. You're not buying right. Like if you're out there buying right, and you're able to refi at 80 cents on the dollar and you're uh -huh. able to acquire at 78 cents on the dollar, you uh -huh. put two cents in your back pocket up front. I mean, if you're... <laughs> I'm waiting for you to finish so I can mic drop. Why don't I get oh. mic drops? I'm making... <laughs> Because you were, you, I saw it in your eyes. I, I, told, I totally mess, messed up your point because you were like, motherfucker, I got this. I got this. I Sorry, I, I just killed your moment. It, when you're doing owner financing or rentals, it's all mm. about buying right. You're talking about eight right. to 900 a month in cash flow off of an owner finance property. And that is which true is, cash which flow. Is, which is not that's a That's Let's, a good one. You know, yeah. But that's because you bought it right. Holy shit, my computer's making noise. I don't know how to turn this off. I got distracted. Real quick, while but, he's distracted. No, just kidding. But, oops, I just hit help. <laughs> All right, back to the back to the business. Whenever we're talking about owner finances and rentals, you have to buy them right. You buy the wrong owner finance deal and you just lost twenty grand. You buy the wrong rental, you you, you lost five because that's the worst you could ever do at a rental. Nobody took bait on that, but no. no, seriously though, if you're not buying right, you'll you're never lose yourself money up. in real estate ever. But if you've got completely disclosed that, if you don't False. lose money, you you you're not you're not going aggressive enough. But with rentals. One of the added benefits to it is you can get them zero out of pocket and you can actually get them with money back into your pocket. So with owner financing, yes, you can get that upfront down payment. Mm -hmm. But with owner financing, you can get that upfront refi, or not the owner financing, but the rentals, I can get that upfront refi when bought right and put ten to 15000 in See, my back pocket can, and still own the asset. I can also refi my underlying debt in the same way with owner financing and collect a ten fifteen thousand dollars down payment up front. You know what I mean? Like That's something that's going to work on both sides, but yeah. I'm also getting a big chunk of a change from my end occupant on so, top of what the bank is gonna give me what for you're gonna, financing What out. you're gonna refi that deed of trust underneath with, mm -hmm. what is that ever gonna appreciate to? Or are you at a finite amount? Well, and, and so yeah, that's the thing like with, so here's, with rentals, you've got an appreciation of the property, right? The value in theory is going to go up. Mm -hmm. uh, over a long enough time period, it will go up, right? It's over a 30 year amp, yeah, yeah, better. Over a 30 year amp Unless you live in Detroit. Up. <laughs> There's always uh, outlying problems. Yeah, right. So, so you do get that appreciation on that. That is one of the things that you can capitalize on the rental for sure. You do cash in with an owner financing with where you're at today. What's okay. the value of the property today? You're cashing in on that, right? And but the thing is, is that you're financing out because one of the one of the issues to that is that hey, okay, so you're only ever going to have this and that's it with owner financing, but that's not entirely true because when we are financing to our end buyer, we're financing at a nine and a half, 9.9% 9 .9 interest rate, right? Our debt is gonna be at four and a half, 6% interest okay. rates. So our debt is getting paid off much more quickly than our income is getting paid off. So over time, our net worth still grows with owner financing because the whole thing with the appreciation- Over time, it goes to nothing. Well, over 30 years, it goes to it goes right. to nothing, right? And and that you do have to sprinkle in permanent money by the end, whether that through. is a, through rentals, through per, through uh, uh, commercial <laughs> buildings, uh, getting into something like a 
like a uh, multi-family unit. I think but you just might drop in yourself. I have okay. This is this isn't fair. This is this is a manufactured debate. This is not Grant's not knowledgeable. This I know. Is. I'm trying. I'm trying to like. I'm taking the side of owner financing yeah. here, guys. I want to be clear. We understand there are benefits to to rentals, right? But anyway, to get back to my point. We've got, so with the rental, the argument is, hey, my net worth is going to go up. The value of this asset to me is going to go up over time. Therefore, why would I cash out on owner financing right now when I have a finite fixed rate? And that's not entirely true because let's say I charge somebody $100,000 at 9.5% and you're saying 80%, so we'll use the same 80% number. Let's say I owe 80% or 80% of that, which would be $80,000 at 4.5% interest, which is a very typical rate, which by the way, I want to address that here in a second. Um, I, I need to take notes because you're, you're smarter than I am and I'm about <laughs> to get squashed in numbers. So what happens is they're paying me at 9.5% interest rate. That, that curve for the principal getting paid down is very gradual. Right. Whereas my 80% my $80,000 debt at 4.5%, that curve is, is much steeper. So in five years, that value of that asset to me, even though it's at a fixed rate that I, when I sold it, that value to my net worth is going to raise by a significant amount because I'm paying off the underlying debt much faster than they're paying their debt to me. Okay. So in both, in both instances, you are raising your net worth. Now, are you planning to keep this rental for more than 30 years? Then yes, the rental is going to last you for more than 30 years and that's going to give you that, that appreciation curve there are 95% of the investors out there buying rentals going to keep them for more than 30 years? Probably not. They've probably got an exit that's sooner in the 10 to 15, maybe even 20 year range. So when you're looking apples to apples at that point in time, both of our net worths are raising over time, except with this one, I never have to do the maintenance in 10 to 15 or 20 years. That is always handled by the buyer. I never have to worry about taxes or insurance going up. I never have to worry about that dip in the market when all of a sudden everything crashes and now rent rates are 30% less than they used to be and now I get a vacancy and I'm having to sit vacant on a property for three months or whatever, you know, looking for a new tenant because I already cashed in 10 years ago and that guy's still gonna pay me for that 20 year time frame. Boom! <laughs> Real quick, before uh, we hear Daniel's thoughts, and I do just wanna throw in there, thank you for your comments, thank you for watching. Um, just to make it a little fun, Drop in the comments, team rentals or team OF, team owner finance, whatever right. whatever side of the fence you're on. So drop in the comments if you're smart or, or team, if you're dumb. Or team Daniel, team Grant, that'd be kind of fun too. Uh, obviously, uh, it's most of us are probably team both, but for this. Uh, but a lot of people are watching. Um, did you Trenton, want to um, respond to that or do we want to jump into a couple yeah, questions? I'd, I'd like to respond to that. I want to say thank you, Cameron, Daniel, Wade, all of y'all out there watching, Trenton, Lacey. Uh, you know, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us up here, run our mouse. But going back to that, I mean, over a long enough time period, I am personally curious which one actually wins out in regards to appreciation. Like, mm -hmm. if let's say we're looking at an average market and we're looking at a four percent annual appreciation compounded on a mm -hmm. on, let's say we have eighty thousand dollars worth of, or hundred thousand dollar asset, you will you will win off of the compound interest on right. the appreciation. Because I mean, over time, I'm, and then, I'm just arguing that it's not a null point. Okay. That we do still get an appreciation in our net worth, but it's not it, that it's not just a zero versus appreciation. That it's like appreciation versus more appreciation. All right, that's fair. So let's take a look at one of the other five ways to make money in real estate, and that's depreciation. We've got the appreci appreciation cycle that we're all looking forward to and hoping for when we're getting these things. But we also have the added benefit of the IRS depreciation schedule, which takes and allows us to remove earned income with a phantom loss. What, what are we gonna do with that like on owner financing? Because every single dollar that comes in, we're getting taxed at full value on, whereas with the rental, 100% of the income coming in is essentially tax-free. Right. And since it's tax-free, I get the added benefit of keeping 30% of my income. That's true, that's true. And there's not a depreciation that we have. Like basically all we can do is we get the long-term cap gains off of it. Okay. Uh, we're, we're taxed long-term cap gains because it's over a, a 12 month uh, period, right? So that's the tax difference. That would be something that rentals do have, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Not unequivocally, but like, like that's something that you, that, that there, there just isn't an argue on. That's something I have to say to everybody that's watching right now is that if you're buying rentals for cash flow, you're buying them for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, your monthly income from that unit 
is going to be ate up by some form of deferred maintenance if you didn't you know come in with the best price best model business plan for landlording your monthly cash flow is gonna get eaten up but you should be investing into rentals for depreciation right not necessarily just single family but owning real estate as a whole has the added benefit of depreciation that many people don't take into consideration when purchasing. And I agree with that, and that's why I try to buy like a rental a year. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. uh, because we do want to employ that. Now, the uh, um, the part to that too that I always want to bring up to people that are thinking about doing rentals is I always say like if you're buying a rental and you do not need to make money on that rental until you have the debt paid off, cool. You're you're doing it the right way. Like what you said. Like you're you know if you're buying it for the cash flow. Don't count on that cash flow. It's not, when you get cash flow, it's a benefit. It's an added like bonus, right? That's the thing with the owner financing side that you get to count on that cash flow. When you, when you lock in with an owner financed sale and you say, hey, you know, my debt is $700, my payment coming in is $1,000, that's your gross and net income. You will always get $300 of actual get to go spend it at the store money every month. You don't have to put it aside in a savings account for, well, I know I replaced everything, but crap happens. What if they break the sliding glass door? I'm going to have to falls. replace that. A tree falls. I'm going to have to replace that. You know, there is stuff that's going to happen on that rental. Whereas you don't have to deal with that with the owner financing side. You don't have to deal with that. And you get that big bump of cash right at the beginning, which similar to, hey, you can't depreciate. There is no argument to, hey, but you get ten to $15,000 up front. You know, like both sides I have their- I get 10 to 15 up front though. On your rental? Yeah that you get to go out and spend. Yes. Tell me how. Buy it at 70 cents oh, on the from dollar. The, from the cash uh, out refi gotcha. at 80 cents on the dollar. Boom, money in my so pocket. So say that your renter mm -hmm. is vacant or it goes Rental vacant. Rental goes vacant. Right? And then you have to re-rent it. You might have a vacant month if you're doing pretty good. You got like a vacant month. If you're doing pretty good, you shouldn't have any vacant month, but that's unrealistic. Um, in our world, in the default world, which would be the equivalent of having a vacancy there, you get another 10 to 15 to 20,000 bump. And here's the thing is that, so we don't want to foreclose on people. We don't want to hit that point, but it's a reality of the game, right? And it, even in FHA, you're gonna have foreclosures, that happens. That is part of the deal with the owner financing side where all of a sudden, if you do have to foreclose on somebody, not only do you then get to now capture all the appreciation that we were talking about before, which again, should have gone up, but it's no guarantee. Can you explain what you mean by that? So here's the thing is I put a, we put a buyer into a house, right? So you, you buy a house from somebody, you fix it up, you owner finance it to Joe Schmo. Five years down the line, and you owner finance it at $100,000, 9.5%, $10,000 down. So boom, you get 10 grand in your pocket. They pay you their, their payments for five years, and then they just can't make it anymore. Well, then you foreclose on them. When you foreclose on them at that point in time, you're going to resell that property now, and you're going to resell that property at the newly appreciated value. Right, similar to how the rental we're talking about, the values go up over time. The values go up over time. If you foreclose and you resell, you're at that new value. So now, let's say it's worth, I mean, what, what would you say? $120,000 reasonable? Sounds know. fair to me. We'll, we'll say $120,000. So now you sell it for $120,000. You get $12,000 in your pocket. So you get a vacancy in your rental, you just have lost a month of income. You get a vacancy in your owner finance deal, you are going to have to pay three-ish, thousand dollars to get that person out but then you get to get another 10 12 fifteen thousand dollar down payment and you sell it at a newly appreciated rate so when you've sold it this time you're selling it at the new rate which is one hundred twenty thousand dollars right but when i bought that house we said it was at eighty thousand bucks for our underlying debt right this well house? now our first buyer has paid five years of that debt for us mm -hmm. so now we might only owe sixty five thousand dollars or uh, that would be unrealistic. Now we might owe you know, $75,000. Uh, well, if it's a 4.5% underlying debt, $75,000, but we're selling it at $120,000. Well, all of a sudden, our net worth went from being a, you know, a, a $10,000, $20,000 grab to now we've got a $30,000, $40,000 grab, and we're getting a $12,000 down payment, and we're starting a new 30-year note, which is going to go even longer, right? And, and, and not to get too nitty-gritty in, into those details, but, and again, this is all secondhand knowledge but Mitch Steven when he was on here and he's done thousands of mm -hmm. these things yeah he's probably done 1500 yeah his, his big thing was at the end of the day it's a wash 
like for the down payment. No, for like if having to, to kick somebody out, having to evict somebody. Having to foreclose. And, so and like, out. Mm -hmm. so for every house that he makes a shit ton of money more, mm -hmm. he has another house that he lost a lot of money. So for him, at least what he said here mm -hmm. was it's a wash. Yeah. And that might be in his market because I know that he kind of specializes more in that sub sixty thousand. San Antonio 60, never really has hit that. Yeah, he yeah. kind of specializes in that sub sixty thousand dollar house, mm -hmm. right? So appreciations, and even even here where we've had massive appreciations, you look at houses that were five years ago worth sixty seventy thousand dollars, they're still not worth much more than sixty <laughs> seventy thousand dollars in most of the spots. Fair right? park. With those houses that Fair were park, worth one twenty yeah. are probably worth like four hundred. Yeah, but that hundred that hundred twenty thousand dollar house, it's I mean, worth I bought a, now. yeah, it's worth yeah. two twenty now, right? So you do those low end homes don't get the benefit of appreciation like that uh, like 50% of the median house does. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're talking like 25% of the median price, 15% of the median price, it's pretty much always gonna be whatever that price point is. Um, but we do get appreciation in these worlds that, that we're looking at. All I've heard through this and talking about the foreclosure model through owner financing is Grant Kemp is, is an asshole and likes to take properties like away people's from his people. Houses. Uh, He's just a slumlord in, in bank form. Let's jump in some of these comments before we get too far behind on them. Uh, earlier we were talking about if you had 30 grand, and this is from Chad Carlson, So, and I, this is very subjective, but so what's the best place to put 30K if not into a rental? We want to count down from three. Count down three, from three. And then say it, three, two, one, marketing. <laughs> there you go, that works. Yeah, because yeah. you can find private money, you can find, if you can find private money, if you can get the deals, if you can get the deals, you can figure out what to do with them, and if you can figure out what to do with them, you'll eventually go up on your net worth. Nothing uh, is more important than getting the deals, getting in front of sellers, you know, uh, you know, Obviously, the education is important. Obviously, you've got to know what you're doing, but don't get caught up in never knowing enough. There's still a lot of things that I don't know about real estate. For instance, I mean, I ran into a house. Um, I got a lead on Friday uh, for, you know, long story short, a, a lot, 450 for the lot. For, you know, if we were going to bulldoze it, put a new property, put another $500,000. I don't know how to do that, but Daniel does. So I called Daniel and we're making the deal work and, and going through it on that side of things. But if I was so stuck in the, the mode of, oh, I don't know how to do this one strategy, I'd better learn how to do that before I send marketing because what if somebody calls me with a lead that's a bulldoze lead and I don't know how to handle it, I'd better learn how to do that, yeah. right? So the point here that I'm circling back to is you've gotta have a baseline of knowledge, which you guys have from watching these videos, you've got enough to go out there. If you've got 30 grand, start putting yourself in front of sellers. However that might be, if it's phone calls, if it's door knocking and that 30 grand is paying for gas, if it's paying for gas for other people to put bandit signs out, get in front of sellers. One caveat to that is, is try to make that 30 grand budget out for at least three months. Yeah, don't spend 30 grand tomorrow. Yeah, you need to, because consistency is a key. So if you're, if you're marketing to Daniel, you need to touch him at least five to seven times before you think he's gonna even notice that you exist. Mm -hmm. So um, if you got that 30 grand nugget, like he just said, budget it and ramp into it. Don't just be like, yeah. oh, I want to send out $30,000 worth of mail this month, yeah. and then boom, you've never done mailing before and completely messed up. Right. Work your way into it, figure out what's working, split test and grow. Yeah. Great advice. Yeah. So, uh, Scott Moyes, uh, he was saying, and this is gonna be a you know pat on the back for Grant, but what most people don't know, including real estate agents, investors, and even attorneys, is that you could pass on all the fee, simple bundle, all the fees, uh, by simply bundling uh, the rights of ownership to a renter, including the tax benefits. So why own a property if you can have all the advantages of ownership without putting your name on the deed or mortgage? Right, that's, that's owner finance, mm, well, I don't know. To be completely frank, I don't understand what he said. I'm trying. Scott, if you're watching. What most, what most you, people uh, don't know, including real estate agent investors and even attorneys, is that you can pass on all the fee simple bundles of rights of ownership to a renter, including the tax benefits so while on the property. And then he follows up, being able to do this allows the landlords to increase his or her net cash flow. Yeah, I think he might be talking well, about... I guess he's landlord side. I mean, it's maybe he's talking about net rents or not knows net or modified gross leases. I don't really. I mean, it's basically. I'm going to just pretend like Scott, I don't know. I think Scott's referring to basically a contract for deed here, um, mm. because you can, you know, uh, essentially because what he's talking about is the fee simple bundle of rights, um, and I basically think that he's a pre, uh, he's talking about um, essentially contract for deed here, where the you still own the property. 
Or like you're, contract, you're physically recorded. the owner of the property uh, on deed, but the tenant is the one that's taking care of all the insurance and taxes and repairs and all that. If we're going to talk stuff. about contract for deed and lease options. I have very limited knowledge yeah, on those two and that's topics. A, that's one of those things that at least in Texas, we ha we have some really big limitations on contract for deed where we can only go up to 180 days. I think on Scott's that. in Utah. And so if you, yeah, I was about to say, if you're in another state, then yeah, the uh, contract for deed is, is the way to go. If you're going to be doing owner financing and uh, you're in another state, do contract for deed. Because basically what it says is instead of me saying, hey, Ryan, I'm going to sell you this house and you're going to get the deed to the property and you're going to give me $90,000 at 9.5% nine for the next 30 years. What it says is, hey, Ryan, I'm going to have a contract with you that says you need to pay me the equivalent of $90,000 at 9.5% nine for 30 years. And once you do that, then I will give you the deed to the property. Um, it makes things for like getting the property back. It's just an eviction at that point in time because they're renting. You just mm -hmm. have to evict them. It's not a foreclosure at that point. So yeah, I believe that that's what he's talking about is the bundle of rights of ownership being. And with contract for deed, you need to be aware from state to state laws change because in some states, once they've paid in X amount of mm -hmm. uh, rental balance, principal balance, they actually do take equity in the property and it's no longer a foreclosure mm -hmm. it's, or it's no longer an eviction. It's still a foreclosure. So a little bit of thoughts on that for those out there doing uh, contract for deed uh, right quentin was giving us love he's like hey this is a good cop it's a uh, well damn good topic but he'll be watching later miranda good morning antonio hernandez daniel dropping bombs no love for grant there no, i'm not getting any love it's all uh, right dominique oh, love that idea. i know who owns the company yeah right daniel <laughs> uh lee porter seems like with adequate capital equity it's easier to scale the business doing owner finance Financing 250 properties is different business than renting 250 properties. See, and even though I'm here to fight for owner financing, I'm not sure that I would take that stance because with adequate funding and financing and equity, either model is going to work. The reason why I'm fighting for owner financing is that most people watching this video do not have millions of dollars in their back pocket to go out and spend. If you've got millions of dollars to go out and spend, again, then you can afford to take down a bunch of rentals and not have to get paid from them until their their debt is paid off or buy in such you know quantities that you're able to get discounts and package deals and that kind of stuff that's a different model right mm -hmm. uh, you might not need the biggest returns at that point in time for it to still make sense of you because that scale I'm not gonna say that financing 250 properties is easier than renting 250 properties as a matter of fact I might say the opposite I might say it's easier to rent 250 properties because you can just put them on MLS and have any old realtor bring you a renter uh, whereas with owner financing, you do have to have somebody with a brain that understands financing, discussing terms with each one of those people and figuring out the terms that are going to make sense with all of that. So I'm not sure that I would agree with that for, for either. And, I, and, either. So what I, I hear and I'd like to throw Daniel wins. That's why there's her. <laughs> we keep harping on the massive amounts of liquidity up front to obtain a rental portfolio. If you are buying right, that is not the case. You can amass a rental portfolio with limited money out of pocket. I'm not going to go to say is no money out of mm -hmm. pocket because you're going to have to get some money to get it rolling. But as you get it rolling, scaling it up when you're buying right becomes a relationship with your bank, a trust that was built with your bank, mm -hmm. and you can scale it up without millions of dollars. But over time, when we're talking about 250 properties versus 250 owner finance notes. Mm -hmm. I'd take a blend of the two. I would take a blend of the two. And I think we're at a point in time on this subject where we could probably continue some questions, but we could possibly pivot towards so much owner finance versus rentals and move towards owner finance and rentals and how to choose what is your better choice for the time being. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'd like to point out also, it, it just depends on what strategy you're in. Because if you did have on the note of 200, if you had 250 uh, uh, owner finance notes, that's a shit ton of money. But once Grant dies, or once the 20, 30 years, I say Grant, but once those notes are paid off, you have a large bank account. Whereas if you had 250 rentals, you pass away. And if you put that in some sort of trust, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a financial planner, but if you put that in some kind of holding mechanism that your grandkids, your great grandkids, your ancestors, or whoever will benefit from that real estate, whereas over the owner finance model, you got a lump sum check. Is that? fair well you can I, I mean because you can simplify yeah it's simplified. I, well, I mean, you can you can I'm, still I'm here to simplify that's those, my role pass that owner financing income on you know the the reality of it is, is that most people again you know we're, we're almost talking a little bit of edge case here because most people 99 percent of the people are not buying uh rentals that they're going to hold for the next 50 years it's just not going to happen right 
I think that is a benefit to a rental, and that is one of the things that you should account for, is that you can hold it for more than 30 years, but if you look at it realistically... I think your hold on a single family should be five to seven years. And also, I'd like to point out that, unfortunately, a ton of investors, their, uh, several of their rental properties were bought to wholesale, they were bought to flip, and they weren't able to wholesale it, and they weren't able to flip it, so it turned into a de facto rental. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's all the time, but I'm mm -hmm. just saying it that happens. does happen, yeah. and that's one of those rentals that you're like, I don't really want it, but <laughs> it's there. Hey, um, Ronnie, think, hey, Randy, hey, Byron, Daniel, Eileen, Quentin, Chad, Sean, Jason, all of y'all for watching. Yeah, Thank you, sure. Joseph. I think, so, I think to Daniel's point, I think it's a good point to really think about, um, you know, like we're talking about, where are you, where are you? Where are you in your uh, abilities? What do you have in, to offer and leverage? And what are you looking for to get out of your portfolio? Because that's how you're going to really decide which side you need to fall on. Right, um, you're right. I, I am harping on. Hey, you've got to have cash to to have the rentals, and a lot of that does hover back to the fact that you need today money to buy groceries. I'm thinking going into a, a full blown, uh, uh, full time job, and you're saying you know cash out refis will get you that money in there too. I'll just put it this way, and this is this is probably you know this is my this is my I guess uh, uh, limited circle of influence here. I just don't see people getting out there and making that into a successful business very commonly. It right? takes a lot of time. It it's the right market cycle, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It just like with owner financing has its, like subject to sure. has its yeah, strong markets. Sure. Rentals have their strong markets. Rehabs have their strong markets. Every acquisition strategy has a specific market cycle that it works the best in. It'll work during all of them, mm -hmm. but it has the ones that'll work the best in. I think for me, when it comes down to owner financing and rentals, they both have their very strong spots and you should analyze each and every property based on a few key things. In my opinion, I love sub two. I'm mm -hmm. not the master of it. Grant is by all means the master of sub two in my world. But with sub two, as an acquisition model, we often look at the disposition of it through a wrap. I think that leaves a lot of money on the table. If we're looking to purchase subject two, each and every property should be looked at based upon its current desire to be put in your portfolio and more so than just that what's going on with the neighborhood mm -hmm. imagine if you had a whole bunch of sub twos in fair park or winnetka heights or the bishop arts 10 years ago and you held on to those as rentals instead of flipping them every property you get a chance to buy sub two you should look at what that market's planning to do over the next 10 years are we looking at in a small appreciating micro market that we're going to look and see seven, eight, nine percent appreciation on yearly. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, there's no way in hell I would ever want to owner finance that because I am going to skyrocket that thing as a rental. But on the other flip side, if I'm in an area of town where I see the, the, the property's never going to appreciate, it's, mm -hmm. or I say it's never going to appreciate, it's never going to appreciate higher than the standard. And it's in an area that I don't want to be a landlord. It's an area I don't want to show up and deal with tenants, tools, and trash. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones I would own or finance all day long. And as a day-to-day -day basis and a decision goes by, do I feel like this thing's going to appreciate rapidly over time? Can I cash flow it as a rental? Do I want to own it and be a tenant, tool, it, and trash kind of guy? Or is this in an area where I don't want to deal with any of that, but I want a fixed return with arbitrage off of a, off of a yield spread between the wrap and the underlying debt? I have to look at every property individually just like that. And it's very true there, and I, you know, and I agree with that. And that's, that's why we talk about, I mean, if you've ever heard me talk, you always hear me talk about having a bat belt of tools and being able to pull out the right tool for the right situation. And that's a perfect realization of why that is. Because when you truly understand all of these different strategies, that's when you get to mix and match. Because those of you who have watched Grant teach me something, anytime I go into talking about subject two and we're using wraparound models, I think I try to be very clear. I am just showing you one disposition of this, right? Because you can, once you buy it with subject two or owner finance, you can do anything you want. You could sell it retail, you could rent it, you can, you know, whatever you want. You can just leave it there vacant so that whatever. But um, the, with the subject two side of things, going into buying sub two and holding uh, as a rental, one thing to consider there is the big benefit to sub two is the lack of cash out of pocket. To have, uh, like we talk about the tenants, toilets, and trash, right? The, the argument, the very true argument of, hey, if you go in there and fix everything up, not just the lipstick, just replace everything brand new from the start, you don't have to worry about that deferred maintenance. 
the challenge to doing that if you've acquired sub two is do you have the capital to put into the property in a second lien position that's going to allow you to go ahead and do those repairs uh, to make sure that you don't have that deferred maintenance down the line. That's something that, you know, like I've got a lot of lenders that don't have more than $70,000 in their, in their IRA account, but they still want it to be in real estate. And so uh, I work with those guys as second lien money to pay for that kind of stuff. I might buy a house subject to, but then I need $30,000 to go in there and fix the house up. So that might be one of those lenders that lends in, right? If you don't have that, it becomes a little bit more challenging because if you do take it over subject to, the point is you don't want to put a whole lot of your actual cash out of pocket into this property. And if you're not putting a whole lot of cash out of pocket into that property, then you are going to have those deferred maintenance issues if you rent the property. Whereas if you do just sell it outright, if it's good for now, the owner is going to be the one that has to deal with that in five years, which is your new owner financed buyer. Now that deferred maintenance, again, if you were in Bishop Arts 10 years ago, is far outweighed by the equity gain that you've gotten from the For those of you listening nationally, we're yeah, talking sorry. about Bishop Arts and stuff like that. Bishop Arts 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 80 to $160,000 neighborhood, somewhere in that mm-hmm. ballpark range. Now it's like 400 to $500,000 ballpark range. And if you're doing some properties, 800 to $900,000 yeah, range. Yeah. So there was a lot of appreciation that hit that market cycle. And if you pick those properties up sub two, because you were paying attention to what was going on in that area and you held on to it, you know, you would have had 10 houses at $100,000 each, so you had a million dollars in underlying debt. But now you've got, you know, eight, nine million dollars worth of assets. So you could have caught a huge appreciation wave and made yourself a multimillionaire just off of that acquisition grab on a bunch of sub two deals that you have no money out of pocket on. And the on. cool thing about the subject two uh, financing on that is, you know, so for, for those of you who don't understand sub two, sub two is essentially taking over on payments. And watch, we've got a grant teach me something earlier on about sub two specifically. Uh, I don't want you to say taking over payments to your buyers, but just that's what we're gonna refer to it as here. The cool thing about that is that you're taking over on the terms that they've got. So now if you're buying sub two, that is owner financing and you're getting underlying debt at 3%, 3 3.5%, 4% that has 20, 22, 25 years left on it. Whereas you're not gonna get those terms from a bank on a uh, non-owner occupied investment property, right? You might be looking at 6.5%, 7%, something like that if you were to be uh, financing that through a bank loan for the rental portfolio. So you can really help yourself out by taking over on that debt, getting a much smaller percentage, a much better term through owner financing, and then turn around if you like it rentals and capture the rental side like that. So real quick, I do want to point out that earlier, Mr. Captain Debate over here, his argument was, or whatever. <laughs> um, clearly a debate champion. Uh, Quentin was, jun- he threw in a, a large comment. I'm gonna, he was, he, he listed out a lot of pros of the rentals, but then he, he then some of his cons against the owner finance if you actually watch some of the grant teach me somethings, we'll address them. That like one of them is like, what if the buyer files for bankruptcy? Our very first episode of Grant Teach Me Something kind of lets shows how you can get around the, the that. The two LLC model. The two so LLC you- model. You can foreclose on yourself. Um, and then and then he was, but he his biggest thing was the taxes. Mm-hmm. What because you know the tax benefits of a of a landlord and owning property. What are the tax benefits of owner finance? Well, and again, we addressed that a little bit earlier here and that there's not, you're not going to get depreciation from an owner finance deal. You're, you're taking it as a long-term cap gain, right? Which uh, is, you know, it's still better than, it's still better than nothing, but it's not, you know, it's, it's still, it's just, it's, it's installment income Uh, that's coming in. Sean Markey was saying finishing his first uh, owner finance this week and and going and only going that route going forward thanks for solidifying his decision mm-hmm. um great, i hope but i didn't solidify that decision because that's not what yeah. i would want to make sure that yeah. we, we pushed across i think it, it, towards the end you want to blend it yeah, yeah. The, the 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 end goal is blend and can i can i throw something in real yeah. quick here we've got because I've, i'm looking at all these team rentals team rentals team rentals here and can i make that an argument for why owner financing is so good is because other people aren't hitting it right? I have become massively successful in this industry because I can pick up the scraps after everybody else that has to go in there and buy at 75% or 80%. I can buy a property. Here's another, I mean, we didn't even address this in the debate. I can buy a property at hundred percent of its value and still turn a six figure profit under on a 50% median house because I know how to own or finance it. 
when you own or finance. Right, exactly. And so we, you know, we talk about, and you'll see me, I think last week actually, we drew this chart out, or two weeks ago, we drew the chart out of like, hey, if you can buy at under 75%, you have the ability to flip it. If you can buy at 80% or below, you can hold it or maybe wholesale it. If you can buy from 80% to 100%, you can own or finance it. If it's 100% and above, then you're at a short sale. Hold on. <laughs> And then with that owner financing model right there, you're able to turn huge profits off of something that otherwise would have been a trash lead for you. And that's one of the huge benefits here. But because everybody here is just defaulting to rentals, I'm coming in behind just sweeping up. And that's where the tool belt comes in. And making money off of it. What I was gonna say is, and it's only because it's pertinent, <laughs> <laughs> that's the word we're going to use. Um, literally, uh, Randy McFeely just picked up a deal. I think closed on it today or yesterday. Did he? Congratulations, Randy. Yeah, good job, Randy. You're the one that told me. Or maybe well, I, I, saw, I, I saw a Facebook post where he said he was closing on it, but I didn't know it was. Anyway, to, but way. that deal was 100% retail, mm -hmm. but he got the seller to owner finance to him, yeah. and he's turning into a free rental. Yeah. So that's 100% and it's a landlord to play. Yeah, so it he came to some pretty sweet financing terms on it. Yeah, he, he came he came to one of our masterminds and we started discussing this particular property and he was like, you know, I, I don't know what to do with this. I might just let it go. And we ended up talking him through a way that he could acquire that property as a rental, cash flow it, have limited to no money out of pocket in the acquisition of this property and still having a great asset to build wealth for himself over the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just because this is, this is where knowing your tool belt comes into play. But Something also having stress. a good enough network to lean on. Yeah. Cause I mean, we, he, he didn't really know what to do. And we just sat down in that mastermind. It's like, Hey, let's do this, 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 and this, let's shift over the, the acquisition for this. And then boom, within 24 hours, we had an agreed contract and now we're closing on it less than August, yeah, a week and a half awesome. later. So going back to the tool belt though, it is very important to not get tunnel vision on your strategy. Each and every strategy has a property that it works great for. And when you're looking at these properties, you need to have enough background. You don't need to have enough background. You, have, you need to have enough network mm -hmm. to know when to do what with certain properties. Like when he's talking about that 80 to 100 cent range, mm -hmm. that is an absolute great opportunity to do owner finance as an acquisition. On the disposition side, you're gonna have to look at that property once again and decide, do you want it as a rental or do you want it as a note? You know, there's definite benefits to both in specific market cycles and in specific sub markets. So, yeah, just totally. things to think about. And on that note, you know, another thing that Quentin asks is, well, all I wanna know is which one actually builds net worth. Well, they both do. I've got a, I've got a, a, a seven figure net worth, right? Whatever. I'm a millionaire off of, I got to add up <laughs> and it's based off of owner financing. Um, and so that, you know, because I've got arbitrage, the, the difference between my note balances and my uh, uh, interest rates and everything, well, rentals are going to build your net worth too. It's just coming off of the equity that you own in that property. You might own equity in a property. I own equity in notes. Yeah. And properties, I've got a couple of rentals too. And going Perfect. back to the comments, uh, Miranda chooses Grant because he's using the mug. She would choose Grant. I, I, <laughs> I just went, I, the mug is too small for me. I need a bigger mug. Uh, Trenton, got, great, this is like watching a Rocky movie. <laughs> I've got a. <laughs> we, we remember that movie very differently. <laughs> We've got a statement here or a comment. I don't want to jump too far ahead from Lee Porter that I'd like to discuss for a second. It says, Albert Einstein quote, compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. I love the quote. And he finishes that off with team owner finance for big ideas. Now I'm not hundred percent certain there, but I might be putting a foot in my mouth, but when you're doing owner financing, you're not on the winning side of compounding interest. Mm -hmm you're on the losing side of compounding interest. Yeah, it's not compounding uh, with owner financing because you're, you're, you're uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Because they're getting principal pay down and yeah. principal pay, you're on the losing side of. Well, and I wouldn't necessarily, it's, I mean, you just, you have, an on, you have an amortizing loan. Compounding interest would be like, hey, I've got $100,000 out on the market. That $100,000 is gonna make 10%. And so next year I've got $110,000 on the market and that's gonna make 10%. So the next year I've got $121,000 on the market and that's how that compounding interest works. With an amortized loan, you've got $100,000 out on the market at 10% 
And you're gonna make your 10% on that $100,000, but at the end of the year, they're gonna owe you $98,000. And then the next year, you're gonna make $9,800. And then the next year, they're gonna owe you $97,000 and you're gonna make 97, you know, it's like you're, make, you're making it on so your, Lee, depreci- or on your uh, amortized amount. So Lee, unless, unless you have some other thoughts to throw in on that on some different things that we're not seeing here, I actually think owner financing is the opposite of compounding. Yeah. Uh, and then going back to Joseph, he was saying, which one wins out depends each individual situation. I don't believe there's a clear cut and dried answer to the question of rent versus seller finance. That right there, my friend, is the correct answer because the two favorite words in real estate are... It depends. It depends. <laughs> it depends. Every single deal, we the two favorite one, words John. is it depends. <laughs> Should I use this? It depends. Yeah. So anyway, yes, you are absolutely correct. The answer is it depends. Uh, Quentin is on Team Daniel, Team Reynolds. Uh, Jeff Steele, there's no time. There's what's the timeline for eviction of a no pay renter versus no pay owner finance? It depends 21 on days. your state. Yeah, it depends on your state first and foremost. But um, you do like go back and watch episode one of Grant. I'm glad Link I chose to, to do that on episode one <laughs> because it makes it easier to point. I back. just we wish we knew what you're doing on the quality of the video. <laughs> we probably need to redo that just because the quality is kind of like. Um, new to live streaming. So yeah, what what I talk about there is how you can, within legal means, after speaking to your attorneys, after speaking to your CPA, understanding that I am neither an attorney or a CPA, nor is <laughs> we have to get Daniel. really deep into entertainment those purposes only. <laughs> entertainment purposes only, but through my consultations and through my brainstorming, that was where I came up with the two LLC idea, and that is basically where you are able to get much the same. Uh, turnaround time on a foreclosure as you would be on an eviction. Versus a landlord, if you know the right guy who hypothetically knows the right guy, it's relatively quickly. <laughs> well, and here's and another always... thing. Here's another thing, actually, to go on the owner financing <laughs> side. Kidding. <laughs> this is where I say I am kidding. I'm I not know, an attorney. I'm I not know, a mafia I know no I'm guys. A... And, and those guys are not sitting over there on the couch. <laughs> that Hypothetically, not, I don't know. Hey, anyway. hey, back to the so, topic. Um, so that's actually going to be, I'm going to turn that into oh, an argument right. for the seller financing side. Because with seller financing, uh, if you do the two LLC system, yes, it's going to cost you more money to uh, foreclose on somebody than it is that you're going to have to evict. Because, you know, eviction, you're going to be spending, you know, a few hundred dollars. Uh, for, uh, foreclosure, you're going to be spending a few thousand dollars. However, when you resell that foreclosure, you're making ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. So it it it, 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 washes. it washes you out at least that amount. Hopefully, um, hopefully. Um, but here's the thing: with a two LLC system foreclosure, your owner occupant files bankruptcy, and you say that's really cute. With a tenancy, does bankruptcy affect the tenancy at all? I've never had to personally deal with it, but mm-hmm. I've heard from a really good friend of mine that went through it that it's mm-hmm. a mother effort. Exactly. So you can actually run into some pretty hairy issues if your tenant decides to play the legal game pretty hard with you. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you've got an owner finance property with a two LLC system, they can try to play the legal game all they want with the LLC that they're interacting with. But guess what? We have an LLC that's in a superior position to that that can just wipe the whole game and call it moot and we get the house back. Also, remember, you're talking to a panel of Texas investors and as Texas investors, we know our Texas shit. Yeah. If you are outside of Texas, Please consult find, your find, find your Texas investors. Mm-hmm. Or uh, your, your not Texas investors. So Marcus Carrington, what would you do about needed repairs to resell the property <laughs> after you foreclose? How would you finance those repairs? Same kind of thing. So if you're, if you're foreclosing and you need to do some repairs at that point in time, just like I mentioned before, uh, there is a lot of second lien money out there. Now, if you are somebody who has a self-directed IRA account that has less than $70,000 in it, you're not gonna be able to do like a first lien loan, really. It's gonna be very difficult for you to find a house, buy it, and fix it up with that amount of money, especially if you're under $50,000. So what you need to do, A, is email me at Grant. <laughs> no, <laughs> no but what, you, what you do is uh, work with somebody. You need to be very careful with who you work with. I mean, my lenders work with me because I've got a good reputation. I've been around for a Can long time. Can you emphasize that one more time? If you're working in a second lien position, you need to be very careful who you are working with because your money could be just completely wiped out. And I'm just going to leave it at that. You could never get it back. And it's totally likely that that could happen. And I would throw out there also, if you're doing, if you're planning on being private capital for anybody, Mm -hmm. make sure you vet the potential investor tremendously 
you know, make sure that they can produce HUDs where their lenders are getting paid because there's nothing more frustrated than calling up one of your, your private capital guys, like, hey, I need some money. I'm like, oh, I'm not doing this anymore not because I just lost some money. Yeah. Yeah. So if you do have to foreclose on the property and you do need to put some money back into it, that's where you're going you're gonna to need to work with your second lien lender people. And, or if you've just got the cash to do it, just do it, right? Because, again, you're, you're um, in a situation that when you sell that property again, there's a good chance that you might just wash on it. Let's say that you've got $3,000 in legal fees that you have to uh, pay for the foreclosure, and then you've got to put in $7,000 worth of repairs, so all of a sudden you're out 10 grand out of pocket. Well, guess what? When you resell that property, you should be getting a 10 or $15,000 down payment, so you might just wash at zero, but you're starting a new 30-year mortgage, right? with new terms at a newly appreciated price. So just like we talked about before, the benefits are huge. I always say you don't want to put pe- you don't want to put people into a house that you that that you're uh, think you might have to foreclose on. It is very important ethically, morally that you're putting people into a home that you think can repay you. But if you do have to foreclose on somebody, you're going to make a ton more money. At the end of the day, it's going to make you a ton more money, and that's just the reality of it. So let, let's get back to comments because we've been here for an hour. I I'm like Chad So let, let's keep going. Yeah. I like Chad. Okay, Grant, you've at least opened my eyes to options. Team, whatever the deal calls for, <laughs> that is the correct answer. Well, actually, I, I, well, early, I'm still like let's three just, pages let's back. Roll through these real quick. Uh, Chad Carlson, looking forward to the June 12th event. Christina, love the info. Hey, we need you on the show too. So I know a shout out from Houston. Elizabeth, we'll see you Friday, but thanks for watching. Kathy Propelia is a great resource for investors. Woo-hoo. She did not get paid to say that, yeah. but thank you. Uh, Jeffson, hi everyone. Hey back. Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth, agree with Grant. We are team owner finance. What, what? What, what? I got one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, wait. In one comment later, Team Daniel. <laughs> She changed her mind within one no, comment. No, she says true, Daniel. I take oh, team Daniel. Oh, I, true, Daniel. My dyslexia is all Thanks, team Elizabeth. Daniel. Uh, Nugget, yep. Uh, your network is your net worth. Very true. Um, okay, Grant, you at least opened my mind for options. Team, what? Okay, that's what you just said. Aaron Perez, like how many owner finance deals can you do per year? I guess that gets me into the taxes. If you owner finance 10 properties a year, it, that's 10 property taxes I have to pay. Is there a safe number to do per year? Sorry if it's a dumb question. There can are no dumb one? questions. Go for it. this taxes. one. Because here's the thing is this and and this is not a direct this is just a general general thing that I see in the market that I absolutely want everybody watching this video to get out of their head. I cannot tell you how many people won't make money on a deal because somebody else is going to make money on that deal. How many times have you run into a, a wholesale situation where the wholesale buyer was fine with the price until they figured out how much the wholesaler was going to make? All the time. Right? And then they all of a sudden they freak out and they don't want to do the deal anymore. Now, I don't run into that, but, but I've seen that happen with people. Um, never pass up on money because of what somebody else is going to make on that money, even if that somebody else is good old Uncle Sam. If you're going to make a profit on that deal, do the deal. Right. If it makes if it makes sense in your numbers, do the deal. Real quick, it's been a couple of years since I've been in college, but uh-huh. and I get I know neither one of y'all did the whole college thing, but I in economics, it's like one of the rules of economics is if if you're going to make a dollar and they're going to make ten dollars, what do you care? You made a dollar. Yeah. Would you give up a dollar so instead of them making ten, they only make five? No, right. that's stupid. So make the dollar. Who cares if they make ten? Um, I, 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 I really am sorry if I'm butchering that economics law, that principle, but at the end of the day, if you're going to make a dollar and they're going to make 10, who gives a shit? You made right. a dollar. You made a dollar. So, and then to directly answer the question of how many owner finance deals can you do per year, as many as you want. Like I said, I've, I, you know, I have months where I'll do 10 or 15 deals. You can do as many properties as you want to do uh, uh, with owner financing, and that's one of the big benefits to it. Now, obviously, everything has its cycle. There's going to be proper, or there's going to be seasons where it's easier than other seasons. Uh, but yeah, um, another uh, Daniel Livingston. Many options are better than only one. Exactly. So the second rule of real estate. First one is it depends. The second one is. Uh, I don't know how to word that. But Let's get through to the questions because we're oh. starting to lose traction here. My bad. I understand. 
well, I don't, special I just, contract needed to wrap up. But I just gave him a shout out, and then you're going to skip him. But that's true. Yes. <laughs> well, More yeah, options. We're losing the traction. Con- well, let's do the let's do the question. So, spe- are this, is there a special contract needed to wrap an existing seller existing mortgage? Nope. Uh, nope. Uh, nope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most definitely. Like, like, <laughs> Oh, hold on. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, positively, yes. You have to um, make sure that you are using the proper contract. So, um, you know, here in Texas, uh, Scott Horn is is one of the most well known attorneys. Matt Acock is a, a friend of Propelio's. The dude is brilliant. He's going to be able to help you out with that kind of stuff. Uh, but you need to talk to an attorney to get the proper contracts for your state. Because anytime you're buying or selling a property that has an underlying debt to it, there are special laws that apply to that that need to be adhered by. Sweet. So, real quick, because Danny wants to get out of here, no. that's what I got. Anyway. We've got the book giveaway. Don't yeah, forget yeah. about the book giveaway. So, what I was going to get to is drop your comments, your last opportunity to get in the book giveaway. Uh, book giveaway, we'll, let's choose three books, and then you get to pick one. So, um, I know your book is Influence, right? Yeah, I like influence. Your book is the one. I like the one thing that is my, uh, my go-to. I'm and I'm I'm currently right reading like Crush It, Grant, uh, not Grant Cordon, um, Gary V. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna whoever wins, you get to pick one of those three books. Nice. Uh, any uh, Sally? She was yeah, saying. Congratulations, Sally. Sally and Keith Riddle. Those are those are good people. And there she said she's close to first subject deal. Too. Okay, congratulations, cool. Sally. Yeah. Elizabeth, second that DFW Maria meetup. Cool. So, anyways, last chance. Going once, going twice. There's a lag, and I'm gonna push the butt. It, what do you want to push the button? <laughs> You're gonna push the butt. Push the button. <laughs> Start. Let's see who our winner is today. Ryan Harper. Propelio. Let's see who wins. Jason, Jason Witherspoon. Witherspoon. You have now Jason won a book. We will send you a private message, figure out which one you want. All right, so final thoughts, uh, Mr. Daniel, because the show is called Grant Teach Me Something. Final thoughts on this whole debate of rentals versus owner finance. I do believe that the final answer is team whatever the deal, whatever whatever it takes. I mean, there are opportunities where owner finance far exceeds rentals. There are opportunities where rentals far exceed owner finance. And there are definite times where the blended model of the two is by far the best choice. So always take a look at it. Always make sure you have the right people in your network and on your team to take care of any property that hits your leads funnel no matter what it is. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and and I agree 100% with that. That's you know we took both sides. Both of us have rentals and owner financed properties. I think that's indicative of the fact. I mean we we uh, we do wholesaling, we do fix and flips, we do rentals, we do uh, owner financing. If you've heard of it, we do it. And I think it's really important that you have that bat belt. You pull out the tools in the right situation and. You surround yourself with the right people. Again, there's going to be times where, I mean, that's how me and Daniel met initially is because he knew that I was the owner financing guy and he had had no clue. He had no clue how to do that. And so he he contacted me and and we worked together and I showed him how to do that stuff. And he's made a bunch of money off of owner financing deals. And I know that he's able to do things that I'm unable to do. And so you've got to have that network around you so that when you, all you need to know is how to identify that you don't know something. And that's what doing at least a cursory uh, viewing of these kinds of lessons and getting the idea of what's out there is going to really help you out with. Because when you do run into a deal where somebody owes more than you're willing to spend on that house, maybe it's time to reach out to me and say, hey, look, they owe 82, it's worth 100. Uh, I'm only willing to pay 75. Is this an owner finance deal? They're willing to sell it for what they owe then you've got somebody like me who can help you through that deal and everybody makes money. So at the end of the day, you've got two answers to this equation. Team, it depends, and team, build your network. <laughs> you got so. Jeff Steele, Team Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so subtle plug to Creative Cashflow and go. Yeah, creativecashflow.com. If you like uh, what you're seeing, if you like seeing stuff you know, really detailed out, I like to take a very pragmatic look at things and, and, and run the numbers and show you exactly how to do stuff from start to finish. Creativecashflow.com is going to be where you can go uh, to learn that. You know, Wednesday mornings, I'm driving in saying, hey, what are we going to learn today? And then at creativecashflow.com, you've got your one, two, three, four step to go from never knowing anything about owner financing to, to busting out multiple owner financed deals 
uh, every month. So I suggest you look there, and then I do personal mentoring as well, which we can talk about there. Subtle plug, Propelio and Go. So on Propelio's side, Propelio is a software tool for real estate investors that you absolutely need to check out. We provide websites for real estate investors, access to MLS comps, MLS deals. We also provide lead lists like pre-foreclosures and probates. We are drastically expanding what we're doing right now, so always be checking back for where we're going. Above and beyond that, I have my own show on Monday. Next Monday, we're going to be talking, I think it's what we call it, Daniel Run Your Mouth Monday? <laughs> Something like that. We haven't came up with a name for it yet. But next week, I'm going to be talking about probates. I'm going to be talking about getting a hold of properties where the, the owners have died, how to handle transferring titles. So we're going to talk about that on next Monday. Uh, as far as what we got going on here, please help us out with a share. Please help us out with the likes and the hearts. Uh, if you liked what you saw today and you know somebody that should be watching this, Tag them in the comments, and that's about it. Um, Team good, Propelio. you good? Team Propelio. Slow mo high five. There we go. Oh, 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 there we go.